Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Fatan Saeed. I'm the Regional Communication Manager for Sabre in the Middle East. Um, today's session, if you've uh, read, is about the uh, uh, distribution evolution and latest industry trends. We are here to help you better understand the changes happening in the market, uh, where this uh, industry is heading to, what is impacting and affecting our overall travel industry. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome our expert speakers from successful businesses in the Middle East. And I'll start with Mohammed Shabib from Tajawal.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Jorge, uh, sorry, Mohammed is the CEO and founder of Tajawal. I'll give a chance for the speakers to introduce themselves and talk about their businesses. Jorge Vilches, our uh, own senior vice president for airline of business, and we'll tell you later who's that, what does that mean. And Ross Vich, our the um, CEO and co-founder of Wego.com. So I think the way, thank you. I think the way we start this session is maybe learn more about the participants, their business, uh, their experience. So we start with maybe Ross, I'll start with you. Sure. Uh, you've started WeGo in 2005, and that compared to what we're seeing in the industry now, the changes and the speed, that sounds like history. So tell us about your experience. Um, how did you start your business? So ca can you just tell us how did you start uh, WeGo? and uh, what uh, industry transformation you've set your business to address and where you ended up now. Sure, yeah, so li like you said, so we, we go started back in 2005. Um, so it's been our sort of a decade long overnight success story. Yeah. Um, we, we started in Singapore and I was, uh, I, I'd spent seven years at, uh, seven years working on product and engineering for, for Yahoo across, the, across Asia. Um, and I, I'd sort of, I'd seen uh, online travel begin to get off the ground. Um, we saw low-cost carriers coming into the region and they weren't yet shoppable across uh, across uh, the big travel agents or through the GDSs. So I, I came across this meta search business model when we bought a small meta in the, in the US by, uh, at Yahoo and folded it into Yahoo Travel and I thought, that's a damn good idea, I'd like to use that. Um, and so we... I got together with my business partner Craig, who was at IHG at the time. Um, he was running e-commerce for APAC, and they were seeing uh, doing more and more business out of the U.S. with Sidestep and Kayak. And you know, we got talking and realized there was an opportunity to bring the meta model to the you know the rest of the world. The original ambition was uh, Asia Pacific. We've since sort of you know, enlarged the the ambition. So we're, we're now to the Middle East. Yeah, so we're now operating right across uh, the Middle East, North Africa region. How, how do you compare APAC to the Middle East? How do you see the difference between both regions or the similarities maybe? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, MENA like APAC is really a whole collection of separate markets. Um, it's hard to generalize about you know, the region as a whole. I, I think, I think the, uh, MENA has a lot more in common with APAC than MENA does with Europe. So I'm always surprised most travel companies roll up MENA to Europe. Um, I, I think the, the keys to making a, a business work uh, in MENA are a lot more similar to the, 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 the challenges and solutions that make them work in uh, emerging Asia. Um, that's certainly been what we found. Thank you. So Mohammed, um, he started 2005, totally different market landscape. You went on the beta testing with Tajawal in 2015, late 2015. So again, what was the market demand and requirements that help, um, led you to uh, launch uh, Tajawal? And where, how, do, how different did you end up uh, doing than the initial plan? Can everyone hear us here? Okay, good. Um, yeah, so Ross has a 12-year lead, no, a 10-year lead over us. Um, that's like five generations in regular life when you look at online. Um, we started in uh, 2015 with loose discussions with the Alta Yar Group, the largest travel agency, offline travel agency in the region. Um, the idea was to, the, the principal idea was to move Alta Yar from offline to online. I think the first thing that we've discussed, we looked at the industry, we've seen that 
the biggest airlines in the world, the finest hotels in the world, they're all from the Middle East. We looked at the online space and we saw there's nothing from the Middle East contributing to the world's growth in, in e-commerce and travel specifically. And we saw a very big opportunity here. That's how this, uh, this whole thing started. We wanted to focus on a very simple customer experience and we wanted to focus on creating something from the Arab world for the Arab world. So nothing that comes from outside. There's obviously global agencies that, uh, global OTAs that move to this region. But we felt there is a very, very big need and data supported us in developing something that caters to the very specific need of the population from this region. And that's and, how it all started. And can started. you highlight what are the specific needs? Like how do you differentiate a local OTA from the global ones? There's, there's very tech technical things that differentiate you, such as payment methods, for example. You have different preferences in this region than in other regions. Um, but the more profound things that you look at is, if you look at the typical traveling family in Western Europe, it's a, statistically it's a 2 plus 1.13, I think, or something like that. So every family has 1.13 children. Um, in this region, it's probably closer to 3 or 4. Yeah. So we have bigger families. We have specifically in the GCC, we have a need when people travel to take maid along, for example. Um, and the travel habits are, or, or people travel much more frequently than, than in Europe with means such as a plane. Um, what about language? And you have different languages you need to cater to here. Yeah. Yes, you have Arabic as a primary language, but this is an expat region. Is that an advantage uh, edge for you? I think... For us, obviously, we think in Arabic first and then we execute. Yeah. That is definitely an advantage yes, because you excellent. understand culture better. Um, in addition to that, we can cater to any language that we think is necessary to cater to in the Middle yeah. East, Western or Eastern languages, yeah. um, which makes a difference then in the long term. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Jorge, coming to you, you come from an airline background and you've been working with Sabre, the technology sector, for some time. And you're SVP for airline of business. Maybe you explain to the audience what that means and what is your focus for this year? Sure. Uh, thank you, Fatin. And uh, thanks to my colleagues here. Um, well, I've been with Sabre for, uh, for six months. As you said, I come from the airline uh, uh, background. I still talk with my, my former colleagues and they ask me why did I join the dark side of the force? And, uh, you know, I never thought of joining the, the GDS, but the moment that we're living right now in this industry is a transformational one. And that's what really called my attention to, to join Sabre. And uh, um, so we created this new airline of business. And the idea is to have an end-to-end -end view on, on what the airline value chain needs in terms of technology from airlines to travel agencies and be able to deliver from the technology side the next generation of retail distribution and fulfillment. And that's basically our, our intent now. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit and I'll change this just to try to drive our conversation. Talk about the traveler. So um, Ross, back to you. What do you think like have been the trends for the past 12 months uh, can, uh, in regards to travelers, expectations, their behavior. What are the trends that you've seen on the market uh, in overall? Sure. Yeah, so just, just looking at that stat, I think our, I think at WeGo our, um, our demo is maybe even a bit younger than that. So yeah. uh, about 65% are under 35 yeah if you, if you um, yeah sum up these two numbers i think you'll reach like above 50 yeah. percent are young it's a young population for sure yeah, but so how does that affect your overall business and, and strategy how do you address this yes yeah, so, i mean there's a there's a, there's a big generational change um you know, uh, 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 rolling across the middle east we see like pretty much anybody under 35 um doesn't have a relationship with an offline travel agent. They just don't. It's not yeah. doesn't occur to them to, to book travel offline. So these are the people who are um, you know, uh, digital first. Um, it's mobile. overwhelmingly mobile. Yeah. So it's about if we look at all the all the search sessions, all the booking sessions on WeGo, we're up around 75, 80 percent in the in the MENA region. So it's about 60 percent apps, another 15, 20 mobile web. Um, so the, 
that the PC as a platform is actually in decline. I was looking at some stats from Google. So the, the wealthier countries in, in the Middle East, PC usage as a percentage of the total population is actually falling. And there's similar trends going on in, um, in China, in South Korea, so other, uh, Japan. Yeah. Um, last 12 months, you know, last you know, 24 months, you know, the, the region's been going through some headwinds. But I think um, it's actually been good for our business. So people are, are looking for value. They're, they're, they're comparison shopping more aggressively. So, um, so 2017, across the region, we're up about 50% overall. Um, we did a, a tad under half a billion dollars in GMV on our platform. It's across all our partners. Um, Q1 2018, um, we've seen growth accelerating. So I think, yeah, we're on track this year. We should just we, sh we should top a billion dollars in bookings across WeGo for the first time ever. Yeah. Um, so the, the um, yeah, so, so some of the economic headwinds has been good for online travel generally. It's been really good for the meta model. Um, the switch from offline to online is moving um, yes. fast. I think it's accelerating. We we're just discussing some of the, the yes. focus right numbers. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I, I'll I come to that maybe. I'll yeah. come to that online growth maybe. And then you highlight uh, that. Mohammed, yeah. I'll ask you the same question. Like, what kind of, uh, what's your observations on the market uh, considering the traveler? They are tech savvy, they are young, uh, attached to online. How, do, how does that affect your overall business and plan? What, what tactics are you taking to address these travelers? I think addressing travelers and generating value for travelers has become a little more challenging these days. We see accelerated growth on every dimension in, in what I call the transformation factor from offline to online, um, exactly what Ross said. Uh, what we figured, and if, if you look at the trending destinations, for example, the, especially the younger population, and these are the ones that count nowadays, they're looking for other things to do than what they have done the last three, four or five years, or even 10 years. Right. Ten years ago, the guy would send the driver to a travel agency to book the flights to London, the same place in London, the same driver in London, the same food in London. Now what they do is they just look at a world map and say, okay, where could I go? Here's my budget. I want to go somewhere. Um, I think this is the massively changing part because there is a, such an influx of information and such a wealth of information um, that people take from all social media channels that they want to experience it themselves. So the focus has moved from routine to experience and from experience to new experiences. And I think this is what makes a difference. The booking process itself needs to be as cumbersome, uh, as, as, uh, as, uh, as little cumbersome, and as cheap as possible. I think that's the, that's the most, uh, yeah. most visible change Excellent. in the process. Thank you so much. So, Jorge, they've highlighted online. And I've just put the slide up that online is outpacing in the, in the region specifically, is growing twice time the overall market. So what does that mean to Sabre? And how are you helping uh, companies in the Middle East to address the online growth? And how are you supporting them? Yeah, um, before um, landing into uh, Sabre, I think it's relevant to, to share some uh, figures with, um, with the audience here today, which is very interesting. This industry, regardless of whatever economic cycle the world is going through, this industry in the last 15 years doubled the number of passengers globally. Okay? The forecast for the next 15 years is to double again from a much higher base. So that will be uh, twice as fast the growth that we have seen in the previous years. In this region, in the Middle East, that growth is double of what we see in the rest of the world. So for the next years, uh, we expect a number of passengers to grow at around 8 to 10% per year. And that's a lot of growth. That's a lot of opportunity. Um, of course, a big part of that growth comes from new players, new airlines, new low-cost uh, carriers that are uh, growing in, in the different regions. The effect of making it easier from OTAs and MetaSearch uh, to have access to these products as well. It has a, a significant uh, impact on growth. And uh, in, in this case, Sabre as a technology provider, we need to make sure that that growth is, uh, is made available across the different touch points and across the value chain. It's, it's relevant to mention that last year, uh, the number of passengers growth globally was around 5% in total, which is 
kind of doubled the capacity growth in the world, but that was 5%, the number of bookings. The shopping volume, which is all the searches that every people, each one of us do, do uh, when searching for a flight, increased last year 90%. 90%. So this is a, an example on how OTAs and MetaSearch and traditional airli um, airlines on direct distribution and traditional agencies on their .com platforms are increasing the, the shopping content. People are starting to book, uh, look and book uh, much more than in the past because of technology. And that's what we're doing. We're enabling uh, direct distribution for airlines and indirect distribution for all travel agencies um, to really um, come up with this growth. Okay, so I know online is important. It's 30% of the marketplace. However, 70% of the marketplace is offline. So how can offline travel agencies uh, stay competitive and how can they continue doing the, the success they're doing, they have been doing for the past. And I'll, I'll ask it again to uh, Jorge and Chibi, but I think you want to answer that too, right? Yeah. Sure. So please. Oh, that's a very good question. I think uh, a few things uh, traditional travel agencies need to do. One, invest in technology. No doubt. Uh, traditional agencies need to also go online build and strengthen their online platforms that is one but also um, technology products for corporates you know that's that's very important like, like get there or uh, uh, corporate booking tools things like this this is very important technology to be able to understand your customers and be able to fulfill that product uh, that promise for those different types of segments. The number of segments that we have today in the world with different types of needs is, has exponentially uh, growing. So that is absolutely uh, one thing that, um, that needs to be done. Another one is uh, really focus on delivering value. So just because you have been there for the last 40 years doesn't mean that you will continue to be there. Delivering value, that is understanding the customer. Data and analytics, understanding the trends of what customers are looking for and be able to uh, work on, on, on products and solutions that address those specific needs. I think that's uh, the second point. And the third point is to start um, participating on additional sources of revenue, for instance, ancillary revenues and, and branded fares. Um, ancillary revenues are very important for airlines. Today you can only buy bags and seats on the direct channel or at the airport, but now with the new tools that uh, we and others are putting in the market, like new Saber Network Space, we can make as efficient the indirect channel to sell ancillaries and branded fares at, as it has been to sell on direct. So this new sources of revenue is also something uh, important for, for traditional Thank you, Jorge. agencies. Shabu, how do you think offline agencies still can compete in this market? I think it's, it's, a, classic, uh, it's a classic comparison uh, between our industry and, for example, the e-commerce the e industry with Amazon leading its way. Um, first of all, I think the classic offline agency needs to reinvent itself. Um, pretty much what you said. We, they need to become much more data focused. They need to become much more insights focused about customers. But then I think what you need to think about strategically is how do you differentiate from the efficient online players? What experience can you bring to the table that online players can't do? So give customers, walk-in customers, for example, and regular customers an experience like VR, an experience such as a face-to-face -face consulting rather than a face-to-face -face sales approach. This is stuff that offline people can do much better than online people. But what you will see, I think, in my belief is, in a couple of years from now, the large online players, they will go offline exactly the same way Amazon went offline after becoming the biggest online player. Yeah. For exactly these different things you can do offline that you can't do online. Thank you so much, Shabi. And I think you're right. You want to say something? Yes, yeah, so, uh, for what it's worth, my advice for the offline guys. Um, Close if, down. If you, if you can't throw the investment dollars of uh, sort of an LTR group at the problem, you should specialize in something. Yes. Like trying to be a generalist, you know, 
all-purpose ticketing agency. I mean, your days are numbered. I, and I, yeah, I think should be what he said about investing in emerging technology. That's that's key too. So we'll come to that later, I think. But uh, we talked about mobile, and mobile is your expertise uh, with Meta Search. So Ross, how can you, how, how do you compare between a mobile web and mobile app, and what is your strategy going mobile? Yeah, so it was interesting when we started. There was no such thing as a native app. So, it's a, yeah. <laughs> so we go web. So our, um, I mean, so we uh, we, have, like, we have about sixty percent of our sessions are taking place on our iOS or Android apps. Um, we've also invested a lot in the the mobile web, to the point where um, if I did an A/B test, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between our Android app and our mobile web experience. And actually, some of the Google guys they get up at conferences and do, use it as a, as a as a demo for that purpose. So mobile web's definitely worth in, investing in. It's the key. I mean, search is still the, you know, the, the Google search is still the main discovery platform for, for most people and will be for some time to come. Um, we find desktop is still where we get our um, higher value transactions booked. You know, if you're doing a multi-sector or a um, you know, 15-day family tour of Europe, you're probably going to book it on a, on a PC desktop than, than mobile. Um, but... Yeah. Do you think the Middle East is jumped immediately to mobile, or there was like a desktop mobile? How, how do you see it now? Do you think you're succeeding with mobile strategy? I mean, there's a there's a whole generation of people who've kind of skipped over PC and gone straight to smartphones. Yes, straight to um, smartphones. So yes, we, we see a lot of those using. Wiggle. Yeah, you see that. Yeah. Um, so, f f I mean, mobile is driving our business today. It's the it's the majority of the revenue. It's the majority of the sessions. Yeah. It's growing faster. Um, from a business point of view, retention is stronger. You have, you know, increased hooks to you know engage with users um, between sessions to to get them back. Yeah. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So, Jorge, I'll come to you. How can the GDS role stay relevant within this uh, transformation, and uh, how can offline players uh, join between offline and online resources to to succeed as well. Yeah, um, I think the um, even though we see direct distribution growing in the last years, and uh, today globally direct distribution something around thirty to thirty-five percent, um, there will always be uh, the need for transparency. There will always be the need to compare. And that is part of the role of, of the GDS, putting all options available for uh, customers uh, to choose. As you said, um, 3.5 hours uh, is taken uh, in every search now uh, to get the, 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 best, uh, the best fare. Uh, Expedia says that um, it takes an average of 38 um, web search to find the right uh, the right fare. So people still need to compare. People want transparency. People want to be able to choose. And having all that information in one place, and that information will be at the GDS, but will also be on the different online channels, is part of the role uh, of the GDS. At the same time, there will always be global distribution because airlines have direct distribution and everybody knows Emirates here and in different countries you could you could have uh, a better or worse knowledge of the different airlines but normally if you are in Uruguay I don't know if Emirates is the top of, uh, of mind right if if you're Lufthansa you're very strong in Germany and in Europe but maybe not wouldn't be the first option uh, in some countries in Asia. So the fact of having global reach and allowing some travel agency in any place in the world to book that flight for any uh, different airline that is uh, available through the GDS, that's also part of, of uh, the, the value that we're bringing. Yes, thank you so much. So. I'll, I'll change the topic a little bit and we talk about digital transformation and this question is for you. 
So governments are spending billions of dollars. We are uh, witnessing 15 billion dollar investments in digital transformation in the in the Middle East. So, how does that affect uh, your business, and how uh, what what opportunities do you see there, uh, Shabib? That's a tricky question. Um, in principle, I think investments in infrastructure by governments make sense. That's in principle. I think when it goes into broadband coverage, when it goes, when it goes into fast mobile coverage, when it goes into payment systems, um, harmonizing different payment systems across countries, cross border, that's something that makes sense. Um, when it is about simplifying administrative processes in governments that eases up um, this eases basically the interaction between companies, setting up companies, startups will come, form an ecosystem and advancement will come. Um, I think the biggest need that we have in this region, and I think this is part of the transformation into a technical um, culture, is a very hands-on investment into education. I think this is the biggest gap where I would probably personally put 10 out of the 15 billion um, in and make sure that our young population, and you said it yourself, and I think in the GCC we have above 50% of people below 30. And if it's a number like that, we need to think about the next big thing. And the next big thing is artificial intelligence and robots um, and 3D printing taking over the world and replacing the classic jobs that we have today. Um, so if you're, if you're someone selling stuff today, you will not have a job in 10 years, period. So we need to make sure that our our children and our our next generation is fueled in order to serve the digital economy that is a global economy so we will compete not only with global players we will compete with robots um, and i think 15 billion is a lot of money put 10 in education and you might you might help us all sitting here on the panel i guess yeah ross is laughing you want to say something <laughs> Yeah. about digital transformation what what um, is impacting your business do you see that an opportunity and how would it help you with this investment yeah i'd love to see some of that money invested in um, just removing some of the friction involved in traveling around the region yeah so like um so in asia we have this thing called the, the uh, apec business travel card so you uh if you, if you travel a lot do a lot of business in the region you apply once um you get like a three-year visa for all the countries in the region. You have express lanes at the airport. I think something like that for the Middle East would be awesome for all of us who do business. So just, or, or even some sort of um, yeah, region-wide ID card. So once you had it, um, yeah, once you'd uh, yeah, you'd pass your checks. you yeah, getting in, you know, getting in and out to do business was was faster and simpler. Um, I mean, they're all big data problems, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So th I think that brings us uh, further to payments. And um, I don't know, I'll, I'll try to engage a little bit with the audience. How many of you is comfortable paying online? And you can raise your hand. Oh my God. See, that's what I say. This number is Amazing. totally, totally yes. bogus. Yes. I think, I think the, the, the uh, um, no, the industry is evolving on a very fast pace that this is irrelevant anymore. This was last year's study. So how many of you feels comfortable paying on a mobile? The same, unbelievable, amazing. So I'll, again, it's the mobile uh, and the payment uh, question. How can we overcome the payment issue, the trust issue in the region? Some people still feel uncomfortable. There are some trust issues and some do trust the global OTAs or the global companies over the local ones. Shabib, do you want to say how, how uh, are you facing these challenges? For me, it's very simple. I don't think there's a payment issue, period. I think if you look at booking.com, if they ask you for money, you give them money online, you, True. you're very happy to put up your credit card. If you look at, uh, if you buy from Apple, you put your credit card. If you buy from Emirates, you put your credit card, you don't hesitate. So it's not a payment method issue. It's a trust. I think it's, it's, it's not it's even a trust. trust. It's an execution issue of companies that are not able to generate this trust. We don't have any issue with generating payments from the different online payment options that we have. Why? Because when we screw up, we fix it and customers know that we fix it and we try to gain trust over time. And I think this is the heavy investment that people don't understand oftentimes is you need to invest in generating this trust. Someone like Ross who's been in the business for, oh, I love saying that, 13 years <laughs> in business, 
obviously spent a lot of efforts and a lot of his branding equity in generating this trust, right? Um, and I think this is, this is the clue to fixing these, uh, these payment methods. These statistics, by the way, come from the old school logistics company created in this region in order to sell their cash on delivery products. Um, I don't think there's any other reason for this statistic. And, and I, think, I think it's fair to be fair that the, the industry is evolving on a very fast pace, that this changes every like six months. I mean, in six months, maybe we'll see less people uh, interested in paying online or, or comfortable paying online. I'll move next. And I'll talk um, about emerging... Yes, if, Jorge. If I may jump here and add Absolutely, to what uh, my colleague here mentioned, I think it's, it's relevant because what is happening in the Middle East is something equivalent in some ways to what I saw happening for many years in Latin America. And um, as Mohammed say, uh, those who have credit cards are comfortable using credit cards. What needs to happen is to increase the credit card penetration in the region. So as many people start having bank accounts and credit cards in their pockets, then they start using them. The first time they do it, they will get comfortable. So credit card penetration increase is a relevant factor what to grow. What about security? Um, what about security? Well, I think in the past, technology was not there to grant that security. Today is more here than a real problem. I mean, today there are, there, there are systems that really guarantee that security. Yeah. yeah. So we talked, we covered a little bit about emerging technologies and, and Sabre has released uh, earlier this month a report about what are the trends and the emerging technologies we are seeing being uh, deployed in the travel industry in 10 years. So. Are you investing in this, Shabib? Are you investing in AI or in chatbots? And what is your experience experimenting this in the region? Again, investing is a very big word. What I would say is we're very experimenting. interested. <laughs> we're very interested in these area. For us, what is critical is, is there a use case that serves a purpose and adds value to my consumer base? I think that's the number one thing. I could activate 15 chatbots across our platforms. Does it really help our consumers in the state of mind that they are at and at the stage of the funnel they're at? In 95% of the cases, what we've seen is that it doesn't make sense because people here still want the personal touch when they run into issues. Where it helps us, and this is purely experimenting, is I fly to Riyadh once a week and I fly every Monday morning at 7 and I come back every Monday night at midnight. I don't want to spend more than five seconds on bookings, right? So sending a message somewhere saying, please book my regular flight makes sense. Yeah. But what's even better than that using a chatbot is if I open the Tejawal app and the Tejawal app will tell me, hey, tomorrow is your regular flight schedule. Do you want me to book? Yes, no. And I just press a button and it would book. If you can apply artificial intelligence to such scenarios where the user saves 15 clicks in order to make a booking, I think this is where you add value. And that's what we're looking into, actually. Excellent. Thank you. Ross, are you investing in emerging technologies? Are you experimenting, as uh, Shabib said? And where can we see this deployed anytime soon? Sure. Yeah, so we, we have a, um, a reasonable investments already in, um, in, in data science. Um, we, you know, we have some of the largest data sets um, of, of, of MENA, online travel, um, user patterns, buying behaviors. And you know, we've developed you know, various machine learning models for different applications, some of them around user acquisition, some of them around pricing, retention. Um, some of it we feed back into the product to figure out you know, you know, which hotels to put in front of a particular user based on what we know about them from their history. And um, uh, we're playing around with chatbots on different platforms. Um, none of it's moving the, the needle significantly, but it's interesting. You know, we're, we're learning from it. Um, where, um, but I, I, at the moment, I think some of the some of the some of what you can do with um, machine learning and deep learning is potentially differentiating. I think for anybody who's in the online game, twelve or eighteen months from now, it'll be table stakes. So if you if you're doing it at scale, it's not really going to be optional. Yeah. So. Excellent, thank you. We come to the distribution part, and I think uh, this is gonna take the last proportion of our discussion. So we've discussed consumers' behaviors, traveler behaviors, shift in some trends. We saw some 
new um, emerging technologies. But all of this has been pressuring the airlines, Jorge. And we've seen them in the past few years trying to change their strategies. They are going, exploring and di going direct. Uh, NDC capabilities have been uh, addressed globally. Some surcharges have been applied. So explain to us how the distribution uh, landscape has changed and where do you see it going? Sure. Um, well, uh, effectively, this industry is, is going through profound transformation. The impact that low-cost carriers are having in the way uh, are, are having in traditional flag carriers is enormous. Um, basically, because there are very cheap fares in the market now. So airlines are pressured to do two things. One, to reduce their cost. And among others, the distribution cost is one of those. And um, at the same time, they need to uh, differentiate. Up until now, the only capability to segment at an airline was cabin-based. So it's economy, it's business, it's first. And within those cabins, you had two or three options uh, to segment. But it was pretty much one size fits all, right? Yeah. So you get a cheap fare if you buy in advance and if you have a minimum stay of X days, right? That was pretty much it. And that is pretty much it until today, how airlines segment globally. Well, that is about to change with technology, right? Um, so there are new functionalities that we are working together with the industry, with IATA, with the airlines, with agencies, uh, called NDC, for instance, uh, new direct capabilities. And what this is going to bring to make it uh, simple to everyone is, if until now, the only thing that was sold was a seat for a specific flight on a specific date, you know, we needed availability, price, uh, and itinerary. Now, the content is going to be much more so that you can be able to deliver tailor-made, personalized offers to different types of segments. So that is going to be very important for all of us in the chain because it's not going to be only about corporate travelers or leisure travelers, it's going to be about that specific corporate traveler and that specific leisure traveler across the whole value chain, across all uh, touch points. You know, we're working on that. We're working on new tools uh, also for travel agencies to be more effective. It, for me, it made no sense when I uh, was working with airlines and when I joined Sabre that still today you go into traditional agencies and most likely they use this green screen or amber screen. Most of you probably have seen that when you go to a travel agency. And we're on the 21st century and why is this thing still there? That doesn't make sense. And in order to operate that, it seems like impossible to understand codes, right? It's like, how do I make a booking? It's really hard. Well, that is evolving as well. So we, as well as other GDSs, we are creating these new platforms that will uh, replicate the effectiveness of direct sales in the indirect channel. So new Saberet workspace, it looks like a, an airline.com web page, and, and that, is, that is the trend, that is what's, what's happening, as well as something that is changing uh, as well, the penetration of ancillary sales and branded fares. Absolutely. So Ross, this says like three and a half hours is the average of somebody looking for flights and comparing options. That's even longer than a flight itself. So not on Wego. <laughs> not on Wego. Yes. He didn't dare to say it. <laughs> After spending three and a half hours, we're doing something wrong. Yeah. So how does the distribution model and the changes in the distribution uh, industry affecting the meta search? Your value proposition has been always uh, finding the lowest first. Are you changing that? How can you personalize the experience now? Yeah, so um, NDC is interesting. Um, anything, so we, we connect to about a thousand different um, partners, so both you know, suppliers and um, uh, OTAs. Anything which, um, any, anything which standardizes the APIs that we're working with is a good thing as far as we're concerned. Um, 
I think I think the the promise of NDC and the reality are a little there's still a big gap between them like every NDC integration we've done to date has been different from the last one like they're all different flavors different versions so um, what what is int what is interesting is um, some of the some of the advanced shopping capabilities around ancillaries. Um, it's making it easier for us to offer those um, to our users on our platform than it was previously. Um, as a as a matter, we're evolving from a sort of a simple search and compare model where you come to WeGo, you shop the market, we send you off somewhere else to book, to more of a full blown marketplace in a sort of an Alibaba or a Rakuten model where. You, you, you do the comparison shop on WeGo, but you also finish the transaction on WeGo. Um, even though in the background, you know, Merchant of Record is still one of our thousand partners. And you know, NDC is making that slightly easier. Um, but ultimately, it, it's plumbing. Yeah. Excellent. So, Shabib, this is for you too. Um, do you think the distribution changes is an opportunity or it's a challenge for you? I think anything that changes is an opportunity in the first place. If you or take positive. a look at... If you take a look at the, uh, at the industry changes right now, I like to compare this with the telco industry about 20 years ago. You had a one-size-fits-all product, which was your home internet dial-up connection. And today, when you do any product on mobile, for example, you can pick and choose whatever you want. And this ties back to the concept of perfect price and product discrimination, which is a negative word. But at the end of the day, what does it mean? Everyone gets what he or she wants for the price point that they're able and, and willing to pay. And I think if, if you take this, it becomes a business opportunity because you can tailor your demand, you can tailor your supply to the demand that is out there in the market. The other aspect is what Ross said, standardization in an in industry that is highly fragmented with different levels in the value chain, I think is a good thing to happen for every one of us. If I want today to extract information out of a flight offering, I need to do some text analysis and take this element out, that element out, automating that will become much, much easier and hence will benefit the end consumer at the end of the day. Excellent. So, um, uh, Jorge, we, we hear about NDC a lot and uh, we hear in the market Sabre talking about beyond NDC and um, what is Sabre doing to simplify this fragmented industry? I mean, going NDC is even complicating it more. So how is Sabre addressing this and helping the overall uh, market? Yeah, I think Ross made a, 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 an interesting comment between what NDC is and, and the expectations, right? Everybody thinks that NDC will change the way that we travel. And we don't necessarily see it that way. It will definitely uh, create more opportunities, create value, but uh, we are still far from that. And just, just to give an example to, to the audience, you know, I, I travel the world meeting airlines and I've met in the last months um, some of the biggest airlines in Europe and in the United States, some of those who are more evolved in NDC. And what we see now, and this is public, what you see with IAG, what you see with Lufthansa, uh, with other airlines, is that their NDC capabilities are still very much focused on how can I have this one, two, or three very low fares that allow me to compete with low-cost carriers. So we are in the very early days of NDC. NDC will give us much more content in the future and will allow for much more segmentation and differentiation. Also, when we talk about beyond NDC, it's because NDC is not only getting an IATA certification, right? Hey, I am NDC level three certified. What does that mean? You know, it's not only staying with that certification and maybe getting one or two or three direct connects with some travel agencies or with some corporations. It's really how to go beyond that and start adding value for the different segments that we have uh, in the market. Excellent, thank you. I'll just, before we wrap up and, and give some uh, advices to the audience, I would like to know Meta Search and OTA. What is the relationship there? And you're laughing, you're smiling. That means, uh, is, it, is it competition or are you friends? 
A good moderator creates controversial discussions, right? <laughs> I know Ross is your friend, we, we, but on we're, the, on we're the, trying in the, the last the second and last <laughs> minutes of this panel. Um, no, um, honestly, I think we're partners, right? Uh, Meta for us is an inbound traffic channel that basically targets a certain type of audience. And we try to optimize this channel for our interest as much as we optimize a channel like Google. Um, and I think this is the role that they play. They aggregate on their, their end customers and suppliers and try to route traffic to the, right, uh, uh, to the right selling point, if you will, or point of sale for the consumers. And this is how we, how we interact. Ross? Yeah, I mean, I, we, we, He's your friend. Wigo has a great relationship <laughs> with, uh, yeah. with um, you know, the Altair group, um, all the brands. But not I, at, I, not I, at I you are in specific. We're talking about OTAs. Sure. We, we, yeah. we work with hundreds of OTAs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. But it, it's like the whole travel industry, right? So we, we, we partner up and down the value chain and we compete up and down the value chain. So the, the relationship between us and OTAs is the same as the relationship between you know, an airline and an OTA, you know, or a hotel chain and an OTA. You know? Excellent. Okay. So just like three takeaways or three advices from each of you to the audience, whether they are online, offline, or what is the three, let's, I'll start with you because apparently <laughs> you have some good thoughts. What are the three advices you would give to the audience? It's tough to say. How many of you work for OTAs? Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. How many of you work for tech companies in this space, not OTA? How many of you for airlines? Hotels. Oh my God, you're by yourself. Established companies, startups. So it's very difficult to give the three points. Um, um, what I would say is, first of all, is what Jorge said is focus on data and insight, regardless of what industry you come with. When Ross says we invest a lot in data science, what he actually means is his life is defined by data science. I'm pretty sure. Like what you do is you look at data all day long. Right? That's the most important thing that you need to do is understand what your consumers want, understand what they might want in the future, and understand what went wrong with your consumer. I think that's my first piece of advice. The second thing is don't jump on every new technology because, frankly, 95% of new technology leads to nowhere and is, is killed. Like Who remembers Apple Newton compared to Apple, uh, Apple iPhone right now? Right? Newton was hyped, hyped, hyped and it died within the same year it was launched almost, right? Um, and the third thing that I would do is focus on the consumer. So data, not every technology counts, and focus on consumer needs. Excellent, thank you, great answer. Jorge? Uh, yeah, well, I think we're gonna have kind of a consensus here in, in some yeah. of the main points. At the end, this industry is growing, this industry is healthy, people are, are traveling much more than ever, but each one of us in the value chain need to understand which one is my role, what value do I deliver in the marketplace. So really understand how to create value and question yourselves because the way that value was created in the past is not necessarily the way that value is being created now. Uh, second, I think technology is fundamental. I agree 100%. I mean, it's not everything that is out there new that will solve. But if you don't have a robust technological platform, regardless of the line of business that you are in the industry, you're in trouble. So you need to have a robust technological platform that allows you to deliver value products to your customer base. Thank you say. so much, Jorge. Ross. Can't disagree with any of that. Um, so for, for anybody in tech, um, I, I, I encourage you to have a look at what's going on in China. Like if you want to see what the future of um, you know, any tech industry is going to look like, spend some time studying what's happening in China today. Um, and you know, 20, 20 years ago when I was a product manager at, at Yahoo, we used to go to Seoul in South Korea because that used to be where we go to see the future um, with you know, broadband. But it's China today. The, the ecosystem there is evolving so fast. Um, you know, we're talking about online payments before. You know, I was there a couple of weeks ago, and um, if you don't have WeChat Pay or Ali, Ali Pay, it's hard to buy anything. You know, I was I was paying with cash in a Starbucks, and they're rolling their eyes and laughing at me. Um, but the like the digital ecosystems and the the, the speed with which things are evolving, um, it's at least five or ten years ahead of what we're we're seeing here in the, in the Middle East. Yeah. 
Um, the other thing I is so if it, for, for anybody building tech products, focus on speed. Um, we spend a lot of time focus on making stuff look good and pretty and functional, but um, every time we spend time on speed, it translates immediately into all the all the all the, all the metrics that move the move the dial. You know, Google bangs this drum repeatedly, but it, it's true. So. Um, I encourage you to you know, benchmark your real end user performances. So there's di different testing tools out there, whether you're running websites or apps um, that can simulate what a real user on a bad 3G network in you know, Cairo or Riyadh is actually experiencing. Um, and as a, you know, it can be very depressing from the point of view of somebody building a product, but I, I highly encourage you to do it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ross. I think it's very hard to summarize. I mean, if we if we look at everything we've discussed today, it's about consumer. Their behaviors are changing, are shifting, are pressuring the overall market. We're, we're seeing the reaction from airlines changing the landscape and the distribution strategy we were seeing. And we are seeing new technologies impacting the overall market too. So I, I hope you found that interesting and informative as uh, we uh, expected. And I would like to open up for questions. If there is anybody here who would like to address any question to our panelists, please just raise your hand. Uh, no questions. So <laughs> there's a question here. So I have one question on the data security. I mean, you've mentioned that you are using or leveraging data science a lot. But in the context of what happened to Facebook, how should we think of data security in your industry, right? So you're using our data to decide or what kind of stuff we see on our screen when I open my mobile. So how do the data security issues affect the travel industry, the online travel space or the OTA space? And you're asking? So I'm asking Ross. This Ross. It's <laughs> uh, a good question. Um, so mo most of the data we're dealing with is non-PII, so non-personally identifiable, which is, you know, is a little less sensitive. But for, for anything which is personally identifiable, and if you're using the European Union's definition of what's personally identifiable, that includes um, anything that can be linked back to a, le uh, a mobile device ID, the, uh, the, the standards that you have to, um, the, the steps you have to take just got ratcheted up dramatically. So we, um, we operated in 60 markets around the world, 25 languages, including a whole bunch of EU ones. So we had to do a you know, complete rethink um, about It's really about re uh, sort of engineering processes around privacy from the ground up. So thinking about why you're capturing something, um, how you how you store it, um, when you delete it, under what circumstances, and um, how to give a user access to it if they if if they come asking for it, and then how to delete it from your systems completely um, if they so um, you know, if they come to you and ask you to do that. Fortunately, um, you know, travel's, you know, it's not that sensitive relative to, you know, we're not collecting that much data relative to a Facebook or a Google. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think any, any, I would encourage any company, whether you're operating in Europe or not, to take a close look at what the EU's just passed and use that as a, as a good framework. I think it's going to get adopted by other countries outside of the EU. So um, I think that'll eventually become sort of the lowest common denominator. Excellent. Thank you, Ross. Any other questions, please? We have two gentlemen here. Uh, hi. Uh, one question is there. Uh, how do you see WhatsApp business uh, generating business for OTAs in the coming uh, year? I think uh, WhatsApp creating business. I think we should have addressed some social media here. Seems it's an interest topic. I think it's an additional of communication with consumers that you capitalize on. Um, you can automate a lot of stuff probably going forward, depends on how the API develops, how you integrate with your own system. Primarily, we use it already as a customer support channel when you need very quick support. There's just a situation where a client books a hotel 
arrives at a hotel and doesn't get actually a confirmed booking, he needs immediate, immediate assistance. And for that, this channel actually works very well. Uh, even for business, it would be important. Just rather than customer support, will it be important for business generation also in the coming years? I think from, from our perspective, we, we probably invest in other channels. Um, more proprietary channels, so we'll probably go more to our uh, our mobile web page itself and our mobile app pages ourselves. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Shabib. You want to uh, answer, Ross? You yeah, want to say I, something? I think chat is chatbots are going to become yes. bigger platforms over time, but I think I suspect Mark Zuckerberg. You know, WhatsApp is part of Facebook, right? So I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a there's a plan at Facebook headquarters to evolve um, Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp into WeChat, so that you know. Everything, you know, if you've ever used WeChat in China, it's like a Swiss Army knife. You can, um, it's like pretty much everything you want to do in your digital life is possible to do without leaving WeChat. And I'm pretty sure Facebook has ambitions to evolve you know, WhatsApp, if not Facebook itself, in, into that. So I think give it 12, 18 months, you'll see it moving in that direction. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. Another question there? Yeah. Hi, uh, I have a question for George. That, uh you mentioned that uh, a lot of the uh, business is still being uh, done on the, the old green screens, uh, coding. Uh, I'm sorry to just, uh, we cannot hear you. Yes. Yeah. So uh, most of the business is still being done on the old sort, sort of screens and not the new UIs and stuff, right? So speaking specifically for group bookings and religious tourism, where there's a lot of uh, business being done, right? So what specifically could we offer in the future? For group bookings and religious tourism, and this is from technology point of view. Yeah, or are you technology. from technology for group yeah. booking? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, I think this applies to to group bookings, but also to uh, all the needs that travel agents have uh, now. Uh, how to make your life easier? And in in our case, we um, we are rolling out during 2018 a new version of new Sabered workspace. That is what I mentioned that is gonna really simplify the way bookings are done also for group traveling. So there's a module for groups there that is significantly simpler than the one that is done uh, traditionally. And you know that also happens with other of our, our tools like like uh, get there, you know, the corporate booking tools, things like that. The idea is, is to really make life easier. With this uh, new Saber workspace, we are making uh, some tests with our partners and to bring an agent up to speed to what a, a normal or experienced agent does uh, is taking much less time. So before it took, you know, around six seven months to start reaching or, or start doing some doing some sales that time has been reduced to half of that so we believe that not only for 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 groups but the idea is to make life much easier for agents to to sell through these new uh these new point of sale tools thank you jorge any other questions we have one minute no excellent our speakers, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the information you've shared. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.